Ireland, ye yes, it is satisfactory to build those houses in the positions that they are. Westbury Homes won't tell us why they choose to build houses under power lines. They won't be interviewed and they haven't replied to our written questions. I've read quite a few reports, read a lot of things in newspapers and different things up and down the country. And it really seems to be more centred on the big power stations. Um, I think you have to make up your own mind. Mm. It's children, I suppose. It's the children I worry about, well, you know, rather right. than me. Because I mean, these gardens, I mean, the children mm -hmm. would be right under the park. I'm sure if they felt, because, I mean, not local authorities are like for giving planning permission, you know, you, um, if they felt there was a real health hazard, then they wouldn't have allowed it to continue. But as councillors in West Yorkshire found out, local authorities don't have the power to prevent building under high voltage lines, even if they want to. Calderdale is one of a growing number of councils who do think there's a health hazard. Members and officers decided to adopt a precautionary approach. And what we did was we introduced a draft plan policy which proposed a 50 metre zone of separation between high voltage power lines such as this one and developments such as housing estates, schools or places of work. We should be looking to people's safety and health and given there's so much space around us to build houses in, it's ludicrous to, to build under potential health risks. You wouldn't build next to a chemical dump, you build as far away from it as possible. If the council had had its way, it would have been able to stop any more building near the power lines up on the Pennines at Barkersland. But the National Grid and Yorkshire Electricity objected to its plan. And after a public inquiry, Calderdale was told it couldn't operate a policy of prudent avoidance, but would have to be guided by the National Radiological Protection Board. I think they have to look at things in black and white terms, whereas our job as local politicians is to analyse risks. They can't say one thing or the other till they're absolutely certain, but we know the way the wind's blowing as evidence is building up that we ought to be allowed to take our precautionary view rather than have a distant body who are looking at the much wider scale of things to, to overrule us. The NRPB does set a safety limit for EMFs, but it's a level to stop you from having a fatal electric shock. We will give our advice to government and to local authorities based on what we see as our best interpretation of the science, taking uh, views from a wide range of people, um, not just in this country but, but abroad, and we will give our advice based on that. If, uh, in addition to this, local authorities would like to to take a somewhat different view of this situation than they can do. And yet you advise the government and the government tells the local authorities, no, you must, you must go by the advice of the NRPB. We believe our best interpretation of the science is that the epidemiology, epidemiology suggests an association. Um, if there is a risk, it must be very low, and the experimental evidence doesn't give support for a causal effect. Other governments throughout the world, Sweden, America, they take on board this issue and they act on it. And although nothing is proven categorically, it's enough for them to say enough is enough. And it annoys me that why are our children less important than the children of other countries? Now a scientist has discovered what could be a missing link in the puzzle about electromagnetic fields and cancer. Dennis Henshaw has a worldwide reputation for his work on one of the agents that cause cancer. It's only in recent years that he's turned his mind to the role of EMFs. I was reading the various research papers and I came across the statement that there was no obvious mechanism by which exposure to electromagnetic fields could cause cancer. And I thought that was very strange because I could think of an, of an obvious mechanism by which a, a known cancer-causing agent, a known carcinogen, uh, could be implicated. Many scientists have looked at what happens when you directly expose human or animal cells to electromagnetic fields. Their results have been inconclusive. There's a fundamental problem with all these experiments in which uh, cells are exposed to EMFs. Cancer occurs when the DNA in the cells is disrupted, leading to uh, a mutation in those cells which then grows. And this is particularly a problem in children, where those cells are continuously dividing. Magnetic fields just don't have sufficient energy to disrupt the DNA. 
But Dennis Henschel's previous work has been on something which can disrupt cells, something which on the face of it has no connection with EMFs. He's renowned for his research on the radioactive gas, radon. Alpha radiation from radon and its decay products is one of the most powerful carcinogens known. But how does Professor Henshaw's work on a radioactive gas tie in with electromagnetic fields? And what's the connection with cancer? Radioactive decay products from the gas radon cling to dust and water droplets in the air. When we breathe them into our lungs, they're absorbed into our bloodstream. The link between these and electromagnetic fields is a breakthrough in the search for one of the causes of cancer. Uh, would you like to come up and get your test track, please? Local okay. school children have been helping Dennis Henshaw with his work on radon, a gas you can't see or smell. It comes from the ground, and for a long time it was associated only with granite. Professor Henshaw and school teacher Jeff Camplin designed a simple radon detecting kit with a special plastic, Tastrac. The alpha particles given off by radon and its radioactive decay products punch holes in the plastic, which show up clearly when it's processed in the laboratory. School children throughout the country have used these kits, and their experiments have helped show that radon isn't just found near granite, it's everywhere, in every home in Britain. The Medical Research Council, which has funded the Bristol team's research, has been exploring the effects of radon on the body. Scientists at its Oxfordshire laboratory are bombarding human cells with alpha particles to see what happens. The alpha particle is emitted from the radioactive atom and travels through the cell rather like a, a very damaging missile, causing a path of damaged, damaged molecules and so on along the, along the track of the particle. Um, and this means that if particular pieces of DNA uh, or other important molecules are in that path, they can be quite severely damaged. As you can see here, there is a break at this particular chromosome, which is not normal. This broken chromosome is from the descendants of a cell damaged by alpha radiation. The break in the DNA can lead to cancer. But even though radon is all around us, and it takes only one alpha particle to start this chain of events, not everyone is susceptible to cancer. What we're interested in really is, is the biology of rare events. The probability that an alpha particle will hit the right cell. The probability that cell will survive. Now, anything that increases the probability of cells being hit, by definition, increases the probability of all these subsequent events. The key to Dennis Henshaw's new research is that he's discovered a mechanism by which our exposure to alpha radiation and our chances of getting cancer are increased by electricity.